Hello everyone, this is Andrew from the Deep Native Foundation. For the past year, we have been working on a really exciting feature coming to the Intel computer called the Bitcoin integration. Once it's released, Canister smart contracts running on the Intel computer will be able to securely send, receive, and hold native Bitcoins without any bridges or wrapping. Today here, I have Manu with me, who's going to talk more about the Bitcoin integration. Hey Manu. Hey Andrew. So Manu, the community has been really excited about the upcoming Bitcoin integration feature. And uh, to, to quote one of the community members, when Bitcoin integration? <laughs> Soon. Uh, Soon enough. Yeah, so actually right now our testnet, uh, the Bitcoin testnet integration is live. So people can start building on that uh, right now. People already are. Uh, and we will continue developing and making things rock solid. So that in the near future, we can uh, also give access to Bitcoin mainnet and call this fully stable and ready for real world use. Awesome. To someone who's not a cartographer, can you explain what Bitcoin integration is and why is it so important? Yeah, of course. So in the blockchain space, we often see that, that each blockchain is a bit of a walled garden to some extent. Meaning that maybe smart contracts running on one blockchain can easily communicate with smart contracts running on the same blockchain, but not easily outside of that. And this has some downsides. Like, for example, we see that there's a lot of value in Bitcoin, but because Bitcoin does not support smart contracts, we cannot use this Bitcoin in DeFi applications. And we try to address that with the Bitcoin in a computer integration, which allows canister smart contracts running on the internet's computer to hold real Bitcoin on the Bitcoin blockchain and use this in smart contracts uh, on the internet's computer. You said real Bitcoin. So how does the, the internet computer communicate with the Bitcoin network? If you want to hold Bitcoin and maybe use, like transact in Bitcoin, then you need two things. One is your, uh, you need like a, a, a secret key and a public key with which you can sign and create transactions. Typically, this is like done by, like a, by, a, by a hardware wallet device that, that holds these, these keys for you. And you need to know the state of the Bitcoin blockchain. Right. And so exactly these two properties we're going to make available to, to, to canister smart contracts on the internet computer. So the internet computer consists of subnets, uh, and each subnet is, is powered by many machines across the world, which is where the security and the decentralization comes from. These, these machines that power the subnet now also talk to Bitcoin nodes across the world to learn about the latest Bitcoin blocks. And the subnet then agrees on which Bitcoin blocks are new and should be taken into the subnet. And the whole state of Bitcoin is now captured in the state of the subnet, which is now accessible to canisters. And how does a canister hold the private key without it being read publicly? Yeah, that's, that's quite the challenge indeed. Um, so, so as you're already hinting at, like we cannot just keep this secret key in your smart contract memory, because typically you assume that this is not always confidential. What we do is we give canisters an interface to request, uh, to request signatures. And behind the scenes, uh, the, the replicas that power the subnet do some multi-party cryptographic protocol, some, th some threshold cryptography uh, to, to construct a signature when a canister requests one. And the goal of this, of course, is that the secret key does not actually exist in one place, but it only pieces of it uh, are shared between the replicas. And when they collaborate, they can reconstruct a signature whenever the canister requests. And this way, a canister can, can really request signatures without the secret key being somewhere in an insecure state. What does it mean to request a signature? It means that the canister is the only canister that's authorized to say, I want to request a signature with this key. And then all the replicas respond to that by participating in the multi-party protocol, this threshold ECDSA protocol to then give the, the canister the signature back. Right, with, and with this, multiple canisters, multiple nodes can sign one message. Yes, with this, a canister can request signatures under their own key in a way that the secret key is still secure because it's not, it does not exist in one place, but it is distributed between all the replicas that power the subnet. And that's why it's called threshold? So you Correct. need a certain number of these uh, replicas exactly. to agree? or Exactly. Okay. Yeah. The threshold ECDSA is, as I see, the main building block of Bitcoin integration. What else can developers use it for? Yeah, actually, I think it's a very flexible building block. So ECDSA is this very, very standard uh, digital signature scheme. So this is not just used in, 
in, in Bitcoin, but in many other blockchains as well, and also outside of the blockchain space, just in many digital systems, ECSA is, is a very common signature scheme. And so now a canister has a way to create such very standard signature schemes and authenticate to anything on the outside world. And so this is what we use to integrate with Bitcoin, but you could also imagine, for example, using this to sign Ethereum transactions or even make digital certificates for, for domain names. There's many options that you can think of uh, uh, build, building on this feature. But if I understand it correctly, this means that when two canisters send real Bitcoins between each other, then that is mined by the Bitcoin blockchain network, right? Correct. So what are the costs that are associated with, uh, with these transactions? Yeah, because, so because they are on the real Bitcoin blockchain, uh, they're, they're as expensive as, as other Bitcoin transactions and also like, not as fast as, as, um, uh, as maybe other blockchains. So, so, so that fee is the same as for other Bitcoin transactions. Now for, the, for running this on the internet computer, uh, you of course also need to pay some cycles, uh, but this would be maybe the equivalent of some USD cents. So in principle, we can create uh, Ethereum transactions. Correct. Yes, that's that would be one other application. Yeah. So we already have things like uh, red Bitcoin on Ethereum. What is the difference in the internet computer? Yeah. So so we see things like yeah, as you mentioned, like red Bitcoin in, in, in other blockchain systems that also tries to use uh, bit, existing Bitcoins for, for smart contracts. Um, on a technical level, it's it's quite a different solution. Um, in, in, in this solution, the idea is that there is some, I guess, central central party in the system that says, uh, you can give me uh, you can give me bitcoins on this address, and in return, I'll give you the wrapped bitcoin token on the Ethereum blockchain back. Right. Um, and maybe vice versa, if you give me such a if you want to go back, then you give me your wrapped bitcoin, and I'll give you the real bitcoins back. But this, of course, is a bit of a of a centralized uh, component in, in in this whole decentralized world. Um, so here, the, the, this party is, is, is responsible for doing the bridging and you see that correctly and um, uh, it's quite a, quite a security risk as, as we've seen uh, in the past. And um, one important question, how can we avoid to see these headlines of hundreds of millions of dollars uh, uh, hacked and stolen from the internet computer using the Bitcoin integration? Yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's a good question. Yeah, I think there's multiple parts of this question. So. We are now building these, these low-level APIs that allow canisters to hold real Bitcoin. Um, and so there, we are doing our very best to make this, make this rock solid, right? We've, uh, we're, we're being very careful in how we implement this. Um, uh, we've done internal and external uh, security audits. Um, and we're, I guess now we're also taking our time to further uh, you know, make sure it's rock solid, such that this part is really secure and trustworthy. Um, but now the next step is that canister developers build on these APIs, build, build on these new functionalities um, to, to, to make cool things with that. And there, of course, we have to hope that the canister developer also does a good job and, um, and builds it securely. Um, so here I, I would recommend that people do some research before they maybe invest in some, uh, some application that builds on this. Uh, and uh, I, would, I mean, it sounds reasonable that they would also do some security audits of their right. code. I guess we have to make it somehow easy for developers to, to use the Bitcoin integration and right. not to have these security risks. Yeah, um, yeah, and so here also the CKBTC comes into play. CKBTC stands for Chain Key Bitcoin, which is uh, a token that we plan to create. The idea is to do something functionally similar to wrapped Bitcoin. Um, so we want, this would be like an internet computer native token, meaning it can you know, transact very quickly. We can use the efficiency of the internet computer. Um, but now the crucial difference between uh, other forms of wrapped Bitcoin is that here a canister smart contract would be doing would be doing the wrapping. So you can now so this canister would build on this direct integration with Bitcoin, and so now a user can send Bitcoin, real Bitcoin, to that canister smart contract, and now the smart contract, the canister, will issue me these CKBTCs in return, um, and those I can now use very quickly and efficiently on the internet computer. And if I ever want my real Bitcoins back, I can send them to, a, to that canister and ask them to get real Bitcoins back. And in the meantime, it is the canister that is holding the private key or it's the replicas that are? Um, it is behind the scenes, it's the replicas that hold the, these uh, shares of the secret key. So it, it, it builds on this 
threshold ECDSA feature uh, to, to actually control those Bitcoins. Is it easier to, tra to transfer CQBTC than using the native Bitcoin network? Yeah, I, 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 will, I would expect that uh, working with some IC native token will be much easier for Canister developers than working with the, the direct Bitcoin integration. Yes. Because for the, the Bitcoin integration, when you send native Bitcoins, the, the ledger that we use is not on the internet computer, but it's the, on the Bitcoin network. Correct. With the CKBTC, the ledger is also on the internet computer? Exactly. Did I get it right? Okay. Yeah. If for, to do a real Bitcoin transaction from a canister, uh, you, would have to initiate this, you would have to initiate this transaction and then wait a long time because these transactions are not giving you quick finality. Yeah. Um, so you would have to like, remember this and later look back at the, at the new Bitcoin state and then see that your transaction went through and then you can, you can continue. Um, and of course, if this is all takes place on that computer, it's a bit faster and, and easier for the developer. Okay. If I understand it correctly, uh, what we have currently is the, on the IC mainnet, you, you, you're able to create transactions on the Bitcoin testnet. And once, as I start developing it, what do I have to change if I want to then switch to the Bitcoin main, uh, mainnet launch or release? Yeah, so hopefully uh, nothing. Um, uh, the, the interface should be exactly the same. You just say Bitcoin mainnet instead of Bitcoin testnet, essentially. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're, we're, we just launched this now as an experimental feature and we limited access to Bitcoin testnet. Um, uh, I guess also to give more time to make sure everything works as expected. Um, and then as soon as we feel we have, there's enough confidence to access Bitcoin mainnet, we'll, we'll turn on these APIs and then it should be no effort for existing uh, dApps to switch to Bitcoin mainnet. And what is the difference between the two on your part? What do you have to still do? What are the next steps that are still in development for the mainnet? On the threshold ECDSA part, we mainly want to run it on a larger subnet, such that the key is shared by many more uh, replicas, thereby increasing the security. Uh, and here, I guess this is mainly a performance challenge to make this uh, as fast as we can. Uh, so that's that's the main thing we're focusing on. Actually, for the Bitcoin integration, it's, it's, it's somewhat similar. There, I guess we want to be resistant to very long Bitcoin forks, which means we need to hold a larger piece of Bitcoin blockchain state uh, which also has some performance complications. Uh, so those are the type of things we're, we're still working on. So once we have the main app release, uh, is the testnet going to still be available? Yes, yeah, we plan to keep this Bitcoin testnet available just like it is today. Um, yeah, we think that's going to be a very useful feature for developers to test their code. Uh, it's with cheaper. Lo with low stakes, yeah, exactly. And if you screw up, then it's still... Yeah. Exactly, so uh, yeah, so we plan to keep this available and then you can test there and at some point flip the switch to target mainnet. Right. And what languages can I use? Well, Rust and Motoko, definitely. Um, so we have example code in, in, in both languages. Um, uh, if I understand correctly, I think uh, Azel, so TypeScript is supposed to support this as well. So hopefully that comes as well. So, um, awesome. So how do you see the Bitcoin integration feature changing the DeFi landscape on the IC? And also, do you have any use cases that you would like to see? Uh, well, I, I, I would imagine there's quite some value coming in, right? I, I would expect that the, 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 the decentralized exchanges on the internet computer might be among the first to, to adopt this technology. Um, I think one very cool thing that I'm looking forward to is that uh, you'd be able to get ICP uh, without going through a centralized exchange by taking your Bitcoin and moving it into the internet computer and there trading it for ICPs, for example. Right. I think that's an exciting use case and I'm sure people are going to come up with much more creative ideas. So you've worked on this feature for the past year. How does it feel like to finally give it to the public and uh, release it to the world? Oh, it's very exciting. When, I, when we had the first Bitcoin testnet transaction go through from a canister, no, that was a very nice, uh, nice milestone. So yeah, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to see this in the hands of developers and, and yeah, look forward to what kind of cool stuff they can build with this. Yeah, we probably have a lot of applications that we can't even imagine that will be possible with uh, using Bitcoin on the IC. For sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's a lot of, uh, well, yeah, first of all, DeFi applications that I guess are the most obvious things to build, but uh, yeah, who knows what, what people come up with. And if I want to start hacking, where should I, where should I look? Um, we, we have documentation on our website uh, that describes how you use this and example code. And uh, uh, so I think that's, that's a great starting point to, uh, start building on these features. Cool. Before we go, thank you, Manu, and all the teams involved that made Bitcoin integration possible. This is a really exciting time to be building on the internet computer. And if you're a developer, please look at our documentation. All the links are in the description below.
We can't wait to see what you will build using Bitcoin integration. Thank you for watching.